The ritual of giving thanks is timeless and timely. It is inexplicably linked to our family values and our community mores. It is a time and a space that we connect to our humanness as we hold hands, as we make the Maghrib select just after breaking fast for the iftar, when we bless the tamakios before the large gathering, and as we grace the one who prepared the meal. We acknowledge, we affirm, just before the partaking thereof. Antarrita bendita, haz que esta comida me salga buena, que no se pase de sal. Loving Father, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. Thank you so much for a beautiful day you've given us. You've spent our life, Lord. You've given us the time that we can come together, Lord, to discuss and tell others about your love and grace and how you have created everything for us that our temples may be clean so you can live in us and we can understand you more and live a life of love, forgiveness, and grace, Lord. So bless this food and bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, thank you for giving us the opportunity to do so. And two special prayers for our guests today. May hope touch each guest heart, spirit, and life. Let the kindness of others bring lasting benefits, bring freedom from addiction, illness, and misery. Open their humanity to include and embrace themselves. And also bless our guests with self-acceptance and love. Spark their imaginations with the belief in the future, bring the possibility of a better life, a safer life, and a more secure life. Amen. She came in 72, she came in 65, she came earlier. Okay. She came earlier because she was born in Berlin and my other sister too, so they were able to emigrate from Poland. We had to wait because uh, it was hard to get out from communist Poland. Mm -hmm. And we were born in Poland, so we had only like, my, my father's aunt brought them, my two older sisters, because they were born in Germany. They were considered German citizens for some reason. So they were able to emigrate, and we had to wait for a long time until my sister invited us, because that was daughter to mother and sister to sister, it was close relationship, so that's why we came later. Okay. I wish we came earlier. I would go to high school here, and it would be different, oh. you know. <laughs> and I just finished high school. I started college in Poland. And in my 20s, so I grew up, I was born and grew up in Haiti. Um, I came here in 1999, at the end of 99, so um, I learned everything I know about a Haitian dish in Haiti because that's where I grew up, so that's where I learned to enjoy, make and enjoy a lot of the, um, you know, food. I say, this is not a real food. <laughs> it's that's what I say, <laughs> because everything is in the can. Just only go up in the can, put it in the microwave, and ready. Okay, Miss. You see, Miss, a nice game too. We didn't know each other. Oh, you met here? Her husband. Yeah, we met here. Brought her here. My ex-wife brought me here, oh. and we didn't want to come. Oh. And then afterwards, my ex-wife she divorced me, and her husband died, and God put us together, and we close to close a lot of things we. We had a lot in common, and we met. We had a lot in common. The main thing is divine intervention. Yeah, we together. But then, I, I did not want to come to America. I was happy in San Lucia. But my previous husband, yeah. he wanted to come to this country. He said it would, we would have a better life. And in Turkey, in Istanbul, big city, like in New York. I lived there, and I grew up there. I married there. And after uh, August 17, 1999, Earthquake happened, big earthquake, and my mom died in an earthquake because her house collapsed. And my house and my job business get uh, so much damage. And after one month, also government uh, collapsed our building, our house, because of the, it was too damaged there, and the nobodies want to live there. And one month after, uh, I got the panic attack. And we went to, you know, the several cities uh, for started the new life, you know. Mm -hmm. And my husband's uh, friends, 
he invited us his hotel in Bodrum, uh -huh. and we were there uh, with my family, with my children, my mother-in-law, because uh, we lost uh, in the same building. Also, my mother-in-law uh, lost uh, his house in the same apartment, you know. And we were together, and last day he said, uh, you don't think about it that in Turkey, you have to think about it in America. America has a big dream for your children. And we said, my husband and I look at each other. He said to us, green card lottery, what does that mean? We didn't know that in that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he explained to us, and we came to Istanbul and went to embassy. Uh, American Embassy and we saw that if we join the green card lottery we have to wait one year if we get lucky we can get it and my husband and I decided to come here and look at it if it is okay for our children future we can come here mm -hmm. and we took the regular visa and my husband and I and we left the, our children to my mother-in-law and we came to New York My mother, of course, yeah. <laughs> I gotta say mom, give it to mom. My mom's 83, you know, had a large family, brothers and sisters. So she was always being creative in the kitchen. She was the first iron chef. She makes she make something happen out of nothing. It was magic in the kitchen. And I just was able to uh, learn a lot of technique from her, a lot of skills, and always remain, remain humble, you know, remain teachable. And I try to relay that message to the people, no matter what you have, what hands you're dealt, you can, you can do something with those hands that you were dealt. You know, you just gotta keep working hard. You know what I mean? That's going to be easy. You just got to keep going on straight up. My mom is a very good cook. And everything she cooks was really, really nice. And everybody just loves how she cooks, how she explains. And she always tries to show us things. We will watch her while she do certain things. And even now, as we are older, she will still explain us well this is the proper way to do this or this is the proper way to do that she's still always interested in whatever dish we come up with let me hear how you cook it i said well i cook it how you show me i don't want to know how you, you know i show you i want to know how you do it you know and this is the kind of person she was um, i learned how to cook for my mom i'm the oldest of four and my mom worked as a nurse 12 hour shifts, my dad worked construction. So I was home and she taught me how to cook pretty much over the phone. Oh. I watched her a lot too. Um, mm -hmm. My grandma, I lived with my grandma for a while too and she taught me some stuff too. My grandma always, uh, when I had time, because I, we go to school and do the homework, but when I had a little bit of time free, she, she always say, come on and learn. You had to learn because you marry, maybe you know how to cook. What your husband say? You're a Mexican? <laughs> I said, okay, I try to learn. And she always say, when you mad, when you sad, when when you angry, don't cook. It's no matter what happened, don't cook. And she's right because when I so mad, <laughs> everything is burned. Everything is a past soul, and I said, okay, I calm down, go sit down, and I don't know, watch a TV something, and I forgot what happened last 30 minutes ago, and I start again, but she always say that, <laughs> and I remember every time I say, oh, when you cook really big for big party or like the traditional tamales, she always pray. And I do the same. When I got married, I didn't know anything about it. And I followed my mother-in-law, how she's cooking. And after that, one month after she left uh, for, the, uh, for her uh, village. And one month I tried to uh, uh, cook the food. And sometimes I got successful, sometimes it was horrible. And after, I don't know. Actually, my mom has a good hands, you know, every time when she's cooking or she's making some things, she was making the good, you know, everybody says, oh, wonderful, this is so delicious, you mm -hmm. know, to, to her. I guess something's coming from my mother. 
little boy and my mom would bring us to the restaurant and I would sit there and watch, you know, the ladies that my mom hired, the chef cooking and stuff, and I would be there asking questions and stuff. And as time went by, I started to do my own thing, started cooking cook in there and stuff. Then when I came in, the, I started cooking good. Then when I came in the U.S., I decided I love cooking. So, you know, my mom started doing little things here and there. And most of the time, they have like family get together. They have invent. And I will always be in the kitchen cooking. And yeah. my mom started to enjoy the food. She's like, wow. And we pick it up from there. Uh, yes, my mom directed us in the right path to eat, you know, natural food. They are good with that. Send them pickles. Then they said, oh, Luna, have um, pickles or um, our spice, special spice that we make for um, our meat. They will say, do you have a piece? That's what we call it. Do you have a piece? I was like, uh, no, I don't have a piece. Okay, I have some for my mother-in-law and they would bring me some when my mother-in-law sent, like when she would, she would send like a big draw of, so um, I share with them as well. So we really don't run out that often. Mostly my mother. Mostly Because mother. When, uh, when we were growing up in Poland, my mom had to work, my father had to work. So our duty was to make breakfast. We would take turns, my sisters and I, and you know, one day I would cook my other sister cook the next day. And yeah, and we, we had to, <laughs> mm -hmm. we had to make dinners, you mm -hmm. know, M maybe not during the school year, but during the vacation, you know, when we were at the home. So, mm -hmm. and my mom would show me, I would watch her make the stuff and that's how we learn, you know, mm -hmm. by doing things, right. not from the books, from her, you know. Uh, the dish that I made that is more of a family tradition, so to speak, is the navy beans <laughs> and white rice. Mm -hmm. A lot of this stuff is from my family tradition. Like, a lot of these recipes I come up with, this is stuff that I, I cooked in my past. I cooked at home. And like I said, I don't give people the average meal you think comes in the soup kitchen. This is homemade from scratch. Everything is fresh. You know what I mean? Like, the plate that you see here, you can see in a restaurant, I'll be charging you 15 to 25 $30 a plate. But they eat it for free. You know what I mean? And it's my job to make sure they eat a quality meal you know, every single night. You know, I eat dinner with them, so I pick somebody every night to go sit down and break bread with them. I feel my town is traditional because it's a lot of poor people's uh, time ago. And that's why my grandmother's wife always cooked for us. Like tortillas, um, it's like soup, a spicy soup. And um, eggs with beans, egg with salsa, always a spicy. <laughs> For the Mexicans, always a spicy. All the families Mexican, they, they had to have a home beans and a spicy and tortilla. I like traditions, and I think we need to keep them alive because. It tells our children where they come from and, you know, the rich background, the culture. So I want to keep that alive. Um, like uh, in the first of the year in Haiti, everybody ate pumpkin soup, right? E like everywhere you go, it's pumpkin soup because it's a sign of our independence. Before, um, when we were colonized by the French, we couldn't eat yellow soup. The slaves couldn't eat yellow soup. So when we got our independence, the first thing we did is everybody is going to eat. You know, that was a sign. So everywhere you would go on the 1st of January, everybody eat pumpkin soup. Not at my house. My mom never made pumpkin soup, but I love it. So I see, I eat it, I see other people do it, and I learn how to do it. Um, I think tradition is good. Not all the tradition is good. But I think it's a very rich um, culture, very rich tradition, and it, I want to keep it in life. Okay. Our seasoning, we make our own seasoning. Even though we use the pre-made seasoning, we, use, um, we make our own seasoning to, from fresh ingredients, such as um, scallion, garlic, um, parsley, thyme, 
we blend them together with salt and with other seasoning with um, we use a lot of um, peppers also especially for our meat to marinate our meat so that's what gives our food more flavor Holy Seventh-day Adventist Church gave us permission we ask and they gave us permission to grow our food in the on the property so we did that for three years yeah about three four years and we got wonderful it is tomatoes cucumbers zucchini squash collard greens was kale we planted a, a apple tree and a plum tree but we didn't get to enjoy that because we we had to leave by then oh. yes yeah yeah but we we, we did celery we will get like oh look pigeon peas nothing like pigeon peas oh i didn't know that used to grow here but it's in my garden and they probably Every little spice, parsley, thyme, fine leaf thyme. I grow this. This is fine leaf thyme. And that is one of our seasonings too. So when I'm able, last year I had a nice little crop. Every night we have a produce stand up front where we try to uh, uh, make fresh vegetables, produce and fruits available to the people come in the kitchen. You know, and a lot of times people just don't know what to eat, you know, and if they're on a fixed budget. So, you know, sometimes the canvas are the easiest thing to stabilize, shelf stabilize, so that's what they go for. But it's, it's just as cheap to buy or cheaper to buy fresh produce and cook it or eat it raw and do help. Our region is well known for the pineapple. Pineapple, did you taste it? It's like they actually plant the wood on it. It's really from central region. Uh -huh. And then there's a papaya, you know, papaya. Almost anybody can grow papaya, but it's also from the Accra area and the yam and the, and the mangoes. Mexico every time. Every day in the morning you cook, and the afternoon you cook, and the night you cook. Three times per day, every every single day. And it's, I don't know. For me, it's the I try to do the same. When I'm at work in the morning, I cook breakfast, like Mexican breakfast, and for my kids, sometimes they the pancakes or whatever they want. But for my husband, for me. We will, I try to make my my real food, my Mexican food. And for the afternoon, I cook again, different kind. Sometimes me, like now we make, uh, we eat the same. Whatever I cook now, we eat in the afternoon. It's, it's no, I don't make different kinds. And then I just only maybe, I don't know, the kids eat cereal and Maybe the meal and chocolate. That's why just only we use for dinner. It's not really heavy because of my towels they eat really heavy. I remember my my grandpa and my my grandma they always have tortilla, tortilla and beans and eggs and whatever. And they uh, okay, but now now they say they are um they're old. They can eat too much like when they are young, but. It's not changed. But in my town now, it's not changed. It's the same. Three times for day cook, three times for day eat. But to be honest with you, the preparation of the food, this is not what I'm doing here. The Lord has shown me that in the preparation, the nutrients was thrown down the sink because the food was boiled in water. And that water, if it's not soup or one pot, like we call it, the one pots are the best because all the nutrients are in there. It's boiled. For example, the dashin would be peeled and boiled in water. And that water would be thrown out. That water would be thrown out. But they did not realize, you know, the nutrients is going out with the water. And all ground provision and even vegetables too were not steamed they were all you would put them on top of the ground provision and boil it and then you throw the water out and then you cut up and and make a gravy and, and eat but the lord has shown me 
the wise way to do this is to steam everything. When I was younger, there was this kind of song we used to sing, um, Crab and Callaloo is West Indian food, you know, I, I really don't know the first thing, but I remember that was a calypso, mm -hmm. and crab and calypso was mentioned. I say, what, is, what is it? I said pickles. They said no in English. Pickles. If you want pickles, you go somewhere, you say pickles. If you say anything else, nobody will know what you're talking about because there is no translation for it. Like in Creole, you say pool, but in English, it's chicken. Well, you know, but pickles, that's... Pickles. <laughs> there is no yeah. translation for pickles. Because uh, she don't use uh, tortillera. She use your hands for make tortillas. Tortillitas de manteca para mi mama que está enferma. Tortillitas de salvado para mi papa que está enojado. Ask me what part of South I'm from. I tell you, South Camden. And uh, that, then where's your mother from? What part of South your mother from? I said, not South, not down South. She was born in Jersey. And they just like, well, where you, they got to dig up somebody from down South. Everybody down South can't cook. You know, it's a, it's a myth about certain things. You know, and all blacks can't cook. Mm -hmm. You know, I ever had a boss that was a white lady from Georgia. She cooked just like me. I was, she invited him out, fresh collard greens with pork and stuff in it. Just like fried chicken, just like just like me. It's according where you come from or according who you raised you to. This medicine. And and I it's dried hibiscus flour. So what I do was I do is I add ginger and uh, I add aloe vera and garlic, and I boil it and drink it. Juice, and sometimes I blend it or I keep boiling it. It fights inflammation, it fights cancer, it fights um, rather, you know, it's good for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, yes. I, I was having a lot of problem with my back. Uh -huh. And it was in, my back was inflamed, and I kept drinking it, and it's like magic. It's vanish. No chemicals. They go in from the ground. They fresh seasonings. Some of them is can help with sick people inside. You use certain herbs for different, and sometimes we season with that very same herb. For instance, um, turmeric. Turmeric is called saffron. Saffron, you can use that for your inflammation in your body. You drink saffron and it will help you pass inflammation. You, a lot of kidney disease, things like that, saffron is very high, but it's called turmeric here. And it's so you can grate it because from way back when my grandmother used to drink saffron with milk, just grate it and drink it. She will take okra, put it in water, and put it in her eye. That's for her eye, cataract in her eye, and the okra water. She'll just cut up the okra and the slime, and she'll hold it and put it in her eyes. This is something we eat every day. And okra is a good for women. You know, like pregnancies and things like that, it do help. And a song. And makes the relax and feel, makes the relax the stomach and make it uh, stress out, get better sleep. Citrus drink, I call it. And that is mainly to clean the plumbing. You know, we have all the ex uh, organs that takes garbage out. And God made citrus to keep the body healthy which is when you eat, when you drink or eat citrus, it, turn, it makes the body alkaline, okay? And that's why it, this drink is so very important and it's best to have it on an empty stomach.
Hello, talk, man. I always say one of these days we'll open a restaurant where you were running because you're a good cook. But you know how people say things, but they never pursue the dream. But he did. And after they opened this place, I have no clue. One day, they brought me around the sermon. I was a little mad, but I was happy. They kept this place for me. The first place they wanted to open on 1.30, they told me after the whole world, you know, never successful. So this trip, they kept everything for me. My mom told me to get in the car. She said, well, we're somewhere. So I'm thinking, like, where's she taking me? So we came to Puerto Junction. But my daughter have seen this place with the name Patiso. She said, Daddy, you know you got a restaurant by the name of Patiso? But maybe God blocked my mind. I didn't know what other child was talking about. I said, where? She said, to Puerto Junction. I said, Trisha, stop it. <laughs> so we let it, I let it go for a little while. So a few weeks, a few months later, my mom brought me in. She and my dad just to get in the car. So when I got in the car, they tell you to Puerto Junction. But instead, they didn't click my mom what my daughter told me. So when we got here, she said, you like it? I didn't see the sun. I just concerned why they brought me to Puerto Junction. So she said, my dad opened the door. When I got in, I was all the world. She said, oh, welcome to our new restaurant. I said, this is the kind of thing that you, you just jump on there and you acting like you're crazy. I said, no, that's not. She said, you like it? I, I couldn't say nothing because I'm standing in this restaurant with all the high-end appliances and stuff because that's what white men got. I work for them. And I'm like, I hopped the refrigerator, I hopped the stove, I hopped in everything, and my dad had a camera taking pictures. I said, keep taking. And I was so excited, even though that was a dream, but I was so excited that my dream had come true. In the summertime, you know, I was making the mantra, it's a, my company name, I put it the Manta Beef Dumpling, small shape like star, and I put the restaurant name Star Manta because the, that's the reason I started. I was making at home and I met the several Turkish family in that time. And we talk, you know, the, and they bought it the outside for grocery store, the Manta, and they didn't like it. When we were talking, and I told them, if I make it this month, can you buy from me? And they says, absolutely, you know. And we know you, and uh, we know how material you use it, and uh, what kind of meat you use it, we know that. And after that, I started to make it the month for selling to people. And I called uh, uh, several Turkish places in Manhattan, and I told them, I'm making the manta, would you like to buy it? And they say, okay. And I prepared the, you know, the whatever they needed, 20 pounds each <laughs> restaurant wanted the manta for trying. And also I made it the, with spinach feta cheese and with mushrooms for vegetarian people, you know. I prepared and I went there and I sold them and they like it. And I started the small business at home. And one day, uh, I wanted to do this not at home exactly, you know. Uh, okay, I have to rent the place and give the job for our people, you know. The, I live in Warhees, ha half far from here. And I rented the, this store in here because of the, around the, this store, too many Turkish families live. And lots of women doesn't have a car in that time. Uh, actually, uh, still like that too, some of them. Mm -hmm. And they don't have job. They are working, you know, the, with their children at home. And I want to give the opportunities all the all those women because of the clothes and they can walk and come over here and walk whatever they want at, you know, the time. Ms. Karen Tellerico, I'm the executive director of the Cathedral Kitchen, which was founded 42 years ago by four young people that heard Mother Teresa speak when she came to America. And her message was very simple. You don't have to do big things to help people. Doing a small act of kindness can be very meaningful to somebody who's in need of that act of kindness. So for 42 years, we've been feeding people who are hungry in the city of Camden. It's grown from a very small staff of five people to today we have 45 people who work here at the kitchen. Uh, in addition to feeding people, we do culinary and baking arts training. We graduate uh, uh, 
about 60 people a year from our programs. 80% of them have found jobs when they've graduated from our program, and some of them have gone on to have very successful careers in culinary, which we're very, very happy about. To get, like, established, like, my documents to be right, like, the cooking documents, you know, the safe serving course and the things so that I can go on and open my own. But I need to have everything in order. So you're going to open your own restaurant? In the future, near future, mm -hmm. yes. Sometimes it's celebrated through all the festivals. Everybody brings out their best. The Akuma Sea is, is, is a big festival in Simpa, also called Winneba. And because it's well known, people come from all over the world to, to witness. The people come from all over the world to witness our Akumasi. Because it's like a celebration where they see whose prediction will come true. Who is fast and wise. And then because deer is very fast. You can't catch deer. They run fast. So the number one dresses in white and black and they paint themselves, paint their faces. They wear, you know, you see number one, you can see that that's number one. And number two, wear like red and black. Okay, now, they get up early in the morning where the deers are. They all go at the same time, different places. For the meantime, it's all been monitored. And whoever catches the deer fed, the biggest deer fed, is bring it into their shrine and put it at the feet of the chief, of you know, or the head of the of, of, of the chief. Because number one, have their shrine with the chief, with whoever sitting in front, you know, guard the uh, the shrine. Okay, so number two also, so it's. It's well documented that, but the whole process, you have to see it when they run it with the music and the drumming. You know, it's something that I cannot even describe it. It's a, you have to really experience it. And sometimes you see children running after those people run after the, the deer. They be running after them until when they get to the, to the forest, the children cannot go because, you know, and when number one catches the deer first, it's known that there's famine. Food is the shortage of food. Yes, and when number two catches it, there's a lot of food. But they all have their shortcomings and downfalls. You know, and, that's, and there's party everywhere in every house. Yay, we have one. Yeah, there's, it's a, it, that's the time to go. We put like um, okay, we put the X mm -hmm. symbol of new life, we put uh, bread, uh, and that symbol like of body of Christ. Now, everything is connected to Easter, and then we put uh, what else? We put salt, which is a symbol of uh, cleanness, and uh, we put ham and uh, Kielbasa, which is, you know how it's spelled kielbasa? Mm hmm Can I do? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we put that, that symbol of well-being, you know, of... Well-being? Doing good, you know, that's... Mm -hmm. And uh, we put a uh, babka, which is, you know, a symbol of sweet life. Put the... Something sweet. Uh, horseradish, which shows the bitterness of suffering, a uh, symbol of that. And of course the lamb, which symbolizes the risen Christ. And what else do we put in there? I guess that's, that's it. Oh, butter, we put butter. I don't know what that symbolizes, <laughs> but I know we put butter all the time too. Some people put vinegar uh, mm -hmm. to symbolize the, you know, when the Christ was on the cross, they gave him vinegar on the sponge. So, yeah, that's okay. about it. Holy Month for Muslims. Um, it's a month of forgiveness and a month where you're trying to do your best to be a better Muslim along with helping others.
Um, me and my friend Natasha have made a tradition of scents. Mm -hmm. uh, she comes over every year for Ramadan and she spends the entire month with me and we fast together just to support one another. Um, I think that it is very important to choose your foods wisely. I had to learn the hard way that you can't just kind of throw anything in your tank. You got to be very careful with eating during the month of Ramadan because your stomach is more times empty, completely empty when you start eating. And you don't want to just throw like grease and sweets and stuff like that in there. So um, I take it quite seriously. The food is more serious, I should say, during the month of Ramadan and how healthy it is and filling. Mm -hmm. Cultural sustainability rests in the desire to pass it on. Food waves are woven into the fabric of our identity. When we share who we are through folk cookery, as we plant together, harvest together, prepare, cook, and eat together, we create opportunities for mutual sharing. For as we pass on the knowledge of our heritage, we are compelled to listen. For the next generation, this creates nourishing empowerment. A prime example is set at Corinne's place, where every Sunday you are greeted by mentored youth. Uh, you know, I thought not that per se, but I was just thinking, I don't know what made me think of this. I only have one child, but uh, when I was growing up, even when I was older, I always picture having a lot of kids and just being there, the kids myself, you know, and just having a lot of kids and I could see us sitting at the table, just eating and just, you know, so that was, that must have been a passion of mine anyway. So since I didn't have a lot of kids, I still have a lot of kids. I do. I love kids. And just, you know, my mother said, my mother would tell me, she said, you and these kids, like the ones that I would employ. And I said, I, I draw from them. I draw, uh, I draw from them, their energy. Because my girlfriend and them said, well, how do you get so much energy? It's just that the kids, and I check with their, their dialogue, a lot of things that they say. That, oh, Miss Corinne, what do you know about that? But I pull from them. And, and me being that way, they can communicate with me. So, I mean, it's just something that's in my heart that I just love kids. They both cook. The one like cooking more than one. But both of them cook. My biggest daughter here, she can cook a big piece, a good piece of rice. She can cook a good big macaroni and cheese. We bake it and she can handle that well. She doesn't like cooking too much. My little daughter, she watches me. She wants to cook everything I cook. I will want to give her a recipe, you know, and she runs it. She's cooking at home. She calls me, Mommy, how do I cook so and so and so? And when I'm done talking to her, she tell me how it come out. And so she's more on the one to one. The other one, she loves to cook. She could cook, but she really doesn't like the kitchen too much. She will mm -hmm. more do, do the food. So, mm -hmm. She's good for the hair, you know? I'll work out the problem for you, but you will do it. <laughs> and now I'm passing it along to my kids, especially my daughter. She was like, Mommy, did you remember did this? Do you remember that? <laughs> she keeps me in check, so she make a list and just text me. Mommy, don't forget to buy this or that. So I am, while I'm doing it, I'm showing her how to do it. So if I forget anything, she'll remind me, Mommy, you didn't get this, you didn't get that. So she is learning along. Uh, as I am doing stuff. So. See my, my granddaughter, Heidi, she's making them already. She, she learned when she was here, and she tried to make her with her other grandmother in Vermont. And she says that they came out pretty good, so makes me proud. I don't like Diane makes them. I, don't, I think Diane thinks they are not healthy, but they used to eat it. Her kids eat it, you know, Mark likes it. Uh, Ella, she doesn't make them. <laughs> I, but her, her daughter makes it, but uh, she doesn't make them. So my mom and my dad, thank you for the drink, which is good. And I'm trying to, you know, inherit what she started from her mother and pass it on down to me. 
So, and I'm gonna pass it on down to my daughter and generation and generation. Uh, Massa, mm -hmm. because uh, she says she feels like Play-Doh mm -hmm. and she wanna play. And I say, okay. <laughs> she said me the do this work because she do it. And I do something else when she uh, finish the Massa. And she, maybe she knows now. I don't know how, I never um, told her. How's you feel? And she's, she know, now she say, oh, it's ready. And I say, okay, I check it out. And when I came here, it's ready. It's not sticky in your hands. I think that's one of the main thing in tradition is the food and especially I know everybody think their food is special, you know, all culture, uh, their food is special. And it is because that's, that's one of the elements that define who we are.